Good morning, everyone. This is Stephanie Orzekowitz, IPMG's Professional Development Specialist. Thank you so much for joining us for our September informational webinar session, Understanding Alzheimer's and Dementia. Before we get started with our presentation, there are just a few items and reminders that I'd like to go over. Today's webinar recording and all associated materials will be available on IPMG's website within two to three business days. You can find this information by visiting the resource section of our website. You can also find information for past webinars at this location. All attendees will be provided with a survey at the end of this presentation. If everyone could just take a few moments to complete the survey, it would be greatly appreciated. Your feedback is truly helpful as we plan and prepare for future informational webinar sessions. And lastly, all attendees will receive a follow-up email within two business days containing a certificate of attendance as well as a link to the survey. Now I would like to introduce our speaker today, who I am so excited to have with us. Maggie Cattell is an Alzheimer's professional who helps community members throughout their Alzheimer's and dementia journey by connecting them to care, support, and local resources. Maggie has her master's degree in liberal studies where she focused on psychology and sociology. She has a strong background in creating humanistic programming that centers on individuals' experience, experiences and outcomes with nonprofit agencies. She is a passionate provider of support and a strong advocate for issues affecting older adults. So without further ado, I would like to make Maggie the presenter, which you should be now, Maggie. I am. Good morning. Thanks for that introduction, Stephanie. It's always so fun when somebody introduces you. I feel like there should be some some music from jock jams playing in the background or something like that <laughs> right, you know right. it's something that kind of pumps you up and you're like oh, man that's really cool uh so thanks for that and very can welcome. you see the screen okay we can perfect well good morning everybody thanks again for having me stephanie i'm i'm really grateful to be here again my name is maggie uh, I am the Senior Program Manager with the Alzheimer's Association. Part of my job is helping people know more about this disease and helping people navigate it. Um, so, you know, as we move through the presentation today, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that there could be a really wide and varying degrees of people's experience with this disease. You know, when I, um, when I got this job, I was so stoked. I went and I told my mom and I was like, oh, I got this job with the Alzheimer's Association and I was just so geeked. And I remember the look on her face where she almost like cringed and she did this uncomfortable giggle and she was like, oh, you can tell me when I go crazy. And you know what's funny is that seems to be the response that I have with lots of people where when we talk about Alzheimer's, when we talk about dementia, there's this kind of pullback where people get really uncomfortable. This happens when I go to health fairs. I was at a health fair yesterday. And you could tell the people who needed help were close to the table. The people were who were uncomfortable. They did a wide berth, and and you know they 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 really didn't want to get close. Um, so I want to acknowledge the fact that those that are that are listening today, you you may have a different relationship with this disease. You may be somebody who is terrified of it but don't have personal experience. You may be somebody who's a caregiver and caring for somebody who currently has a diagnosis. You can be somebody who's concerned about yourself or a loved one. Um, so I want to recognize the fact that this can be a difficult topic, and um, please know that uh, I am open for all opportunities to to share information, um, to um, give you guys uh, answer questions, whatever it is that you need for this to be a helpful session for you all. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about Alzheimer's and dementia. So. Um, some of our objectives is we are going to compare Alzheimer's and dementia. You're gonna hear me use the terms interchangeably, I promise, I'm not doing it to trip you up, there is no pop quiz. Um, but we're gonna talk about how they're similar, how they're different, and why you may hear me use the terms interchangeably. We're gonna talk about how these diseases impact the brain. We'll talk about risk factors and then strategies, um, excuse me, stages of the disease. We're gonna talk about current treatments and what's going on in the research world, and then we'll talk about some resources. 
So the impact of Alzheimer's disease, we're going we're gonna to watch a, a quick blurb where there's going to be some facts that are going to pop across the screen. Um, but first, I love to start with, with talking about what we know, um, because what's so interesting is we, we think we have an idea of what this disease is, but do we really? Um, so approximately how many Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease? And you don't have to type anything into the chat if you don't want to, but approximately how many Americans do you think are currently living with Alzheimer's? We have 3 million, 6 million, 8 million, or 11 million. So we have more than 6 million Americans who are currently living with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. This obviously doesn't take into account those who are diagnosed with dementia or those who are undiagnosed, but potentially struggling with memory thinking or behavior changes. About how many Americans do you think provide unpaid care for people who have an Alzheimer's diagnosis or a dementia diagnosis? Do you think it's 8 million, 11 million, 14, or 18? So we have 11 million unpaid caregivers who are currently taking care of somebody who has an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. That's not taking into account those who are paid work in long-term care, hospice, or home health care. So we know that one in three seniors dies with dementia. It's an extremely common disease. Um, and what's interesting is that it's a disease that's a lot more complicated than what we think that it is. Um, so true or false, Alzheimer's is a normal part of the aging process. And I hope you guys were saying false. So it's important that you know that Alzheimer's, it's a brain disease and it causes problems with not just memory, but also thinking and behavior, but it's not a normal part of aging. Um, true or false, people younger than the age of 65 can get an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And this is true. Um, although it's a lot less common, there are people who receive diagnoses under the age of 65. It's something that we call young onset or early onset Alzheimer's or dementia. There are some people that I am working with who are as young as um, uh, in their late 40s who have Alzheimer's or dementia diagnoses. So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative brain disease that impacts our ability to, um, to, to operate normally. So as we mentioned, it impacts somebody's memory, their thinking, and what's so interesting is it also impacts somebody's behaviors. So although we normally think that this is a disease of memory, it actually is much more complicated than that. It impacts so much more. Um, so dementia is kind of this umbrella term. If you think about an umbrella, dementia is a description of sim symptoms that impact memory thinking behavior changes. And Alzheimer's is a cause of that dementia. Other common causes of dementia include vascular dementia, which includes um, or which uh, normally is associated with uh, heart disease, dement uh, diabetes, anything that can impact somebody's um, ability to have really good blood flow in their body. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is also a very popular dementia. So if anybody is a Disney fan, I love to go down to Orlando every now and again, put on some Mickey Mouse ears and parade around like I'm a kid. Um, Aladdin is one of my favorite Disney movies, and Robin Williams uh, played Genie. He committed suicide uh, in the past, I think it's been five years, and he had dementia with Lewy bodies. It is a dementia that's very behavior-based, and it caused things such as hallucinations and um, really uh, behavior-based disease. Another type of dementia is frontotemporal, which is another behavior-based dementia. There are more than 400 different types of dementias that are currently out there and being diagnosed. So it is a, a really, really large grouping of diseases. Um, so although we know that Alzheimer's, it is the most common cause, it accounts for 60 to 80% of those dementia diagnoses. It's important that you know 
that it's different than normal changes that happen as we age. So uh, you may hear me use my parents as examples as we move through this program, uh, but I want you to know they've given me their consent, so I'm not saying bad things about my parents. Um, but I love to use them as an example because they're fantastic and very colorful people. My dad's an engineer, retired engineer. Uh, he's very orderly. And uh, when he comes in the house, he always hangs his keys on the hook right next to the door. Uh, if I need to move his car or I need to go and get something from it, I know that I can find his keys right on the key rig. My mom, on the other hand, she is kind of a, a beautiful tornado, <laughs> but she is kind of all over the place. And she carries around this purse of doom. This is a purse where if the zombie apocalypse was to happen, she would have everything that she needed in that bag. She would have a change of clothes. She would have some Oreos. And of course, probably 50 unused or used tissues in the bottom of her bag. She never knows where her keys are. What we have to do is we have to dump out that purse, sift through all of the tissues, and then we find her keys. The reason I bring this up is we talk about what is normal and what is not normal aging. So for example, my mom not being able to find her keys, that's not something that would concern me. She never knows where they're at anyways. My dad not being able to find his keys, that's something that I would pay attention to. So it's important that as we talk about this disease, it's very, very unique to the individual. Signs and symptoms are very specific to who each of us is. It is a progressive brain disease, which does mean that it does get worse over time. So we talk about the brain. Um, as you and I sit and you know, you're sitting here listening, I hope you guys are drinking coffee and eating a donut. Um, you know, those are all things that we can do because our brain allows us to. And we, it's hard to imagine that the reason that our hearts are beating, that our lungs are, are, are open, that we can breathe, that we can move, that we can speak, listen, um, that we can see, all of that happens because of our brain. So because this is a brain disease, that does mean that all of those things are impacted when there's a disease of the brain. So each of us, if you think back to kindergarten, each of us are unique snowflakes, right? Um, all of us are, are very unique individuals, our memories, our behaviors, the way that we speak, um, our personalities, they're very um, specific to who we are. All of that happens in the brain. So if you can think about Alzheimer's disease, there are billions of neurons that are in our brain and that's what allows us to, to do the things that we do. My grandma, my Busha, we're a Polish family. Uh, she's 94, still lives by herself and makes the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. I'm throwing down a challenge here. If you make good chocolate chip cookies and you wanna take that title from her, feel free to mail me some chocolate chip cookies. Uh, she lives by this sketchy bridge. Uh, she lives in a villa. She's kind of in the middle of no man's land. And this is one of those bridges that when you drive underneath it, you try to go quick because you know that sucker is going to come down at some point in time and you don't want to be under it. Um, so when we talk about Alzheimer's or dementia, what happens in the brain is a neuron fires, that signal travels down this roadway and it's received by the other neuron. And that firing and that connection, that's what allows us to do what we do. It's what allows us to think, have memories, make decisions and move. So if you think about that bridge I talked about by my Bush's house, if you have two cars that drive into that bridge, it's such a narrow, it's such a narrow opening, no other cars would get through. And that's what happens with Alzheimer's disease. So the neuron fires, that signal is trying to travel down that road but there are already something on that road that keeps that signal from getting to that other neuron. So if it fires and the other neuron doesn't receive the message, that neuron, because it's not being used, it actually will wither up and it'll die. These dying neurons cause the brain to shrink and that's what causes the symptoms that happen with Alzheimer's or dementia. Now the buildup that's on that roadway, it's beta amyloid plaque and tau tangles. We'll talk about this a little bit when we get to research. Um, but essentially what happens is it interacts, interrupts the ability for the neurons to interact with each other. The different types of dementia are diagnosed based on where in the brain uh, either the disease started or what area of the brain the disease is kind of interacting with. This is not a new disease. So Dr. Alois Alzheimer's was talking about these brain changes more than a hundred years ago. and um, 
it, research and science has come so far since then, and we'll talk about that. But the overall sentiment is still the same, that this is a neurodegenerative disease, which means it gets worse over time, and it causes the brain cells to die, and this leads to the brain to shrink. And as I mentioned, it's a change in not just memory, but also thinking and behavior. One of the most common questions I get from folks is, who gets it? How can I prevent from getting this awful disease? It's definitely one of the most feared diseases. Um, so another question, what is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? Is it genetics, family history, or is it age? Interestingly enough, it's age. So um, Alzheimer's, it's not a normal part of aging. Age is the greatest risk factor. So we know that for every year somebody ages over the age of 65, uh, they have this increased risk of developing a Alzheimer's or a dementia diagnosis. So when it comes to genetic risk factors or, or just risk factors in general, um, there is a very small part of Alzheimer's or dementia that is genetic, is less than 2%. And what I mean by that is actual causation, meaning that for sure, if you have this gene, you're going to get the disease. There's two families that are currently being studied right now who have these genes, these causation genes. One of them is in South America, one of them is in a Scandinavian country, and they have a gene that causes them to get young onset Alzheimer's disease, which means that they're getting diagnosed very young. Uh, one of the families that's in South America, they are getting an Alzheimer's diagnosis in their 40s. Um, and that means everybody in the family is getting it. But very few people have that causation gene. There are other people who have genes that increase that risk. So some other things that can increase your risk are having other family members who are uh, close blood relations who have the disease, such as a parent or siblings. Um, some other things can, can absolutely be lifestyle factors. We also know that there are certain populations that are at a higher risk. Black Americans are twice as likely to have an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis than white Americans. Hispanic Americans are one and a half times more likely and two thirds of Americans who are living with Alzheimer's, they're women. Now, although we know that women do live longer than men, the research does not show that the fact that women live longer, it, it doesn't line up with why women are receiving this diagnosis at a, such a higher rate than men are. Some recap. Um, greatest known risk factor is age, and that risk continues to increase each year after the age of 65. Family history is important, especially if you have a, uh, a parent or a sibling who has had this disease. Um, there are different types of, of genes um, and that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, and we know that Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women have that increased risk, that increased likelihood of this diagnosis. So if you go on to the intrawebs, um, I don't know about you guys, but if I wake up in the middle of the night with a tickle of the throat or I don't feel well, the first thing I do is pull up my phone and I dive into the internet and I will diagnose myself with some of the most terrifying diseases by the time the morning comes. There's something about Googling in the middle of the night that just is not good. Uh, and that also comes into play when we're talking about this disease. Um, so if you were to go through and to Google the stages of Alzheimer's disease, you'll notice that there are different, um, different models that are out there. Um, there are 12 stages, six stages. At the Alzheimer's Association, we just use a three-stage model just because it's much more simple. It's much easier to interact with. Um, I'm going to move this box out of the way so that way I can see everything. Um, so it's important to know that um, the stages, they're not black and white. They aren't something that, um, that somebody is necessarily going to fall into cleanly. And if you have somebody, if you're a ca current caregiver, um, be aware that there's a lot of gray area when it comes to these, these stages. So the first stage is, is that needs to be taken into account is that you don't have any symptoms. 
that this is somebody who doesn't have any cognitive changes, um, but there potentially could be some biological changes that are happening. So especially with Alzheimer's disease, there's a buildup of those, those plaques and tangles, right? Those things that keep the neurons from talking to each other. Those can start to build up in the brain long before there start to be symptoms. And we're gonna talk about why that's important in a second. There is a new kind of pre-stage that has popped up recently due to a new treatment, and it's called MCI, which stands for mild cognitive impairment. Um, mild cognitive impairment right now is kind of the earliest pre-stage that you can get where there is the very beginning of cognition changes, the very beginning of some of those losses of what somebody who, what they normally were able to do prior to. MCI is extremely important because they're there's a lot of um, emphasis on getting a diagnosis as soon as possible. The earlier on that you get a diagnosis, it gives you the ability to plan, it gives you the ability to make some decisions, and it also opens up your options for being able to utilize medications. In the mild stage, or also could be called early stage, this is where symptoms are, are starting to occur, where people are really starting to pick up or notice things that somebody normally is able to do very easily they may have to think pretty hard move slower or are really um, having to put some effort behind being able to do it uh, we have this uh, early stage patient who is on our council for the association and he used to be a pilot and he talks about how difficult it was when he was starting in kind of this MCI or early stage, how difficult it was for him to be able to do normal calculations that he always had done every single day, every time that he had flown. And that's when he knew that something, ha something is happening, something is changing. He was able to make these calculations all of the time and all of a sudden it was requiring a lot of effort for him to be able to do it. He also talks about how much effort he had to put into being able to act normal being able to do what he normally did every single day. So early stages, this person is still conversational. They can still tell you what they want, what they desire. This is a great time in the disease to start having some of those hard conversations, um, such as what do you want your care to look like? Uh, how would you like for this to look? Who do you want to be your power of attorney? What do you want your, in your will? Uh, those conversations should be happening, honestly, for all of us as soon as possible. There doesn't have to be a diagnosis to have those conversations. In the moderate stage or the, the middle stage, this is where symptoms start to impact somebody's ability to do what they do every day. When you're interacting in the long-term care industry, you'll hear the term ADLs or activities of daily living. Um, so in the middle stage or moderate stage, this is where two to three activities of daily living are starting to wither away or be lost completely. So things such as brushing teeth, getting dressed, fixing food, being able to toilet. Um, these are when somebody, things that we have done every single day of our lives, all of a sudden we're no longer able to do that. That's when we're entering in the middle stage. The middle stage is the longest stage. Um, and truthfully, this can be a very short disease or it can be a very long disease. In some cases, people have it weeks, but there are people who I'm interacting with who have had this diagnosis for 19, 20 years. Each of us are unique snowflakes, which means that the symptoms are unique to us. That includes the disease progression. In the late stage or the severe stage of this disease, this is where the symptoms are really impacting somebody's ability to do what they do every day. And this is normally where advanced care is required. They're not able to shower. They struggle to use the toilet. Um, there also can be a loss of um, taste. So there's a struggle to get somebody to eat. Um, and they become nonverbal. In the end stages, um, somebody with this disease, you know, as the brain shrinks, that impacts our ability to be able to do everything. So that means that there may um, be some issues with slips and falls because they have a hard time uh, moving their legs. Uh, they also have a very slow reaction time. That's what happens when a lot of people have to stop driving. Interestingly enough, people also start to lose their peripheral vision. It's why it's important that we always approach somebody from the front and at eye level um, when they have this disease. So these stages, again, they can go very quick or they can go very slow. That middle stage is the longest. 
there are kind of those three broad phases, the MCI, uh, excuse me, asymptomatic, meaning that there may be change happening in the brain, but symptoms aren't showing, MCI, and then there are the three stages of the disease. Um, if you're interacting with a doctor, they'll use mild, moderate, severe, but it also could be early, middle, and late. None of us would experience these symptoms or the progression of the disease the same way. When I say it's neurodegenerative, I want to be very clear, it means that it gets worse over time. So although somebody may have a good day, on one day they may be able to remember who you are, remember your name, and you know a couple hours later they may not recognize you. This is a disease that has lots of up and downs, but there is a, a downward um, trajectory for the disease. And while the symptoms do worsen over time, people can progress through it fairly slowly um, or fairly quickly. So we've talked about you know, the, what this disease is and kind of what it, what it can look like and what the stages are. Um, what can you do, right? So, so what are the treatments? What are some of the things that are out there that, that can help? And we're starting to make some really cool, um, some, some cool advances when it comes to research. So you're gonna see this timeline that's popping up on your screen. You know, the first description of this disease was in the early 1900s. In the 90s, we had medications that came onto the market and these medications helped manage symptoms of the disease, but did not slow down the progression or change the trajectory of the disease. So some of the more common medications that you may have heard of are Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, and Namenda. Um, most recently, in 2014, we had Namzeric, which is a combination of two of the medications. And what those medications do is they can help with, um, with some of the behaviors, some of the anxieties, some of the restlessness that can come with the disease. Now, last year, um, June 7th, last year, if I can remember the date, you know that it's an important date. It was a really big deal for the Alzheimer's Association. A new medication hit the market. Um, and this medication is called aducanumab or aduhelm. Aducanumab is a beta amyloid dissolving medication. So if we think about that bridge by my Boucher's house, if two cars are pulling in, one is beta amyloid and one is tau. Those are what keep people from, from using that road. That's what keeps that, that signal from reaching one neuron to the other. What this drug does is it goes through and it dissolves that beta amyloid. So that way that there's a little space where another car could drive through that road if it wanted to. This is a huge deal for the Alzheimer's community. It's the first drug of its kind, meaning that it's actually a treatment. It actually can treat the cause of the disease um, and it can help slow down the progression. What it cannot do is it cannot bring back neurons that have already died. It does not regenerate neuron loss, but it absolutely slows down the progression of the disease for some people. With this new, um, this new treatment, there are four other treatments that are currently in the research pipeline that do the same thing as aducanumab, as agihelm. They're beta amyloid dissolvers, meaning that in the next few years, this is not gonna be the only treatment drug on the market. We're gonna have several. Um, so I am a cancer survivor. I just finished my chemotherapy for breast cancer 12 weeks ago, which is very exciting. Um, you know, going through my breast cancer journey, the treatment that I received, it was very specific to who I was. So for example, when I went in for chemo, I was weighed. Um, they would go through and they would take all my vitals. I would meet with the oncologist. I would sit in my chemo chair. And then there was, you know, there was somebody who was mixing those drugs specific to my type of cancer, to, to who I was, how I was feeling that day. It was very, very specific. I think it would have been, there's a lot of expectation that the cure for Alzheimer's disease was going to be this magic pill that we could put on, on somebody's tongue, they could swallow, and all of a sudden, our loved one was back, right? And Truthfully, Alzheimer's and dementia treatment, it's gonna look a lot more like cancer treatment. It's going to be very specific to who that individual is, what type of Alzheimer's or dementia they have, what types of symptoms they're experiencing. 
So some of it is also going to be this change in thought about what Alzheimer's and dementia treatment is going to look like. But because we have these new drugs that are coming onto the market and that are in the research pipeline, it does mean that with each one that gets approved, the science and the drug gets better and better and better because it gets to evolve and learn from the mistakes of the, the drug that was approved prior to. So there are going to be some really, really exciting things that are happening in the next, for sure, few years. But I would say in the next 10 to 15 years, Alzheimer's research is just going to, to be a completely different space. Because everybody experiences these signs or symptoms very differently, it's important that you know that these treatments are very different for each person. There are some people who take Namzeric or um, you know, one of these medications and they don't work at all. Other times people experience harsh side effects and they don't wanna take them and that's okay. These drugs are also only good for a period of time. They're only good in the early stages and truthfully, they're only good for about 12 to 24 months. If you're um, interested in learning more about what these drugs are or if they might be right for a loved one, I highly recommend that you speak to a, uh, a healthcare professional. Neurologists specifically are very well versed in these medications. Alzheimer's research I kind of alluded to is at this really, really cool point where um, treatments are starting to, to hit the research pipeline and are going to start entering the market. The only way that Alzheimer's research can continue to move forward is if we have people who want to participate in Alzheimer's research. And you do not have to have a diagnosis to participate in some of these clinical studies. Um, so I have a volunteer right now. Her mother had an Alzheimer's diagnosis. She's participating in two clinical trials, one with IU and one in Texas. Um, the one at IU is testing her blood and kind of making sure that she's cognitively sound each year. But the one in Texas, they're actually looking at brain training. So they're looking at cognitive exercises and whether doing cognitive exercises can actually slow, prevent or slow somebody acquiring this disease, which is really cool. We just recently had our Alzheimer's Association International Conference in July, and there were all kinds of things that were being talked about. Uh, a lot of discussion was around, uh, obviously, social isolation. We know that the last two years from COVID have been extremely taxing on those who have an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. So there was a lot of talk about the importance of, of uh, social activity. Another really interesting one is the relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, I actually attended a webinar which was talking about the importance of taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon every single day to kind of let your brain regenerate. And I tried to use that as an argument with my boss for why I should get to take a siesta between two and three o'clock every single day. It didn't work, but if you're interested in making that argument with your boss, let me know and I'll pass along the information to you. Maybe if your boss will say yes, my boss will say yes. Um, there is also a lot of research that's happening right now on prevention. Um, so diet, uh, talking about the importance of um, not having a lot of fatty oils or fried food, also looking at uh, berries and fish and how those are, are just fantastic brain foods. Uh, physical activity is one of the greatest things that you can do to um, potentially prevent a Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. Keeping your heart as healthy as you can. We know what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, and again, I mentioned that cognitive activity and the social activity. Um, so we know that it's incredibly important that this research continues to move forward. So if you're interested in participating in any clinical research, uh, we have a, uh, a website that I'm going to be bringing up here in a second. It's called Trial Match. And it basically is a way for you to go through and to link yourself with one of those studies and say, yes, I'm willing to travel. No, I'm not. I wanna do this online or I wanna meet in person. Uh, I'm willing to, to let them take a blood sample. And it matches you with if there's any clinical trials in your area that kind of line up with, with what it is that you're looking for. So just a little bit of a recap, we are really on this kind of breaking new, really optimistic and hopeful future for what Alzheimer's and dementia is gonna look like. Um, and we have come so far over this past decade. We know that um, we still have a long ways to go, 
but with this new treatment hitting the market and being uh, you know, the first of its kind, we're really, really optimistic. People who are living with the disease, people who are caring for somebody who have the disease, or if you're just you know, concerned about it, or you, know, you, you wanna help, you can uh, volunteer for clinical studies. And not only are these awesome opportunities to help further science, you also may have access to some really cool support systems, and you could have access to a breaking new treatment. Aduhelm was only created by people who participated in research, were on it for multiple years before it was passed. Um, so we can't do that without people participating in research. There are both drug and non-drug studies that are taking place, and you can go to this website, it's alz.org slash trial match, and you can find out what free clinical studies are happening in your area. So I would be completely remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the Alzheimer's Association, who we are and what we do. Um, and I think it's important for me to say that, you know, at the association, we really believe in a world without Alzheimer's disease. Um, we believe that there will be a cure and, you know, we really wanna be in a space where we're able to help people access it, where we're able to give information out there so that people are recognizing the signs and symptoms as early as possible, getting diagnosed as early as possible so that they can use those medications. I wanna stress one more time that getting diagnosed as early as possible, if you're noticing changes in a loved one, if you're noticing changes in yourself, it's important that you go and you speak to a doctor because there are other things that can kind of look like Alzheimer's or dementia. And it's also important you know what's going on. Um, so things such as interactions with drugs, um, urinary tract infections or other infections, high or low glucose, uh, issues with blood pressure, all of those things can change somebody's cognition or impact somebody's ability to do what they do every single day. Um, if anybody here is a caregiver for a senior, we all know what a urinary tract infection can do. It can really change somebody's ability to, to think and, and behave the way that they normally do. Um, being diagnosed early, it's a multi-stage process. I highly recommend that you work with a neurologist or a neuropsychologist. And what they'll do is they'll take you through a multitude of tests. Uh, the most common test that most people hear about when they do their Medi uh, Medicare annual wellness exam is that they have to remember three words and then 10 or 15 minutes later, the physician or nurse will ask them for those three words back. It's something that always makes my parents and my grandma very anxious. They hate those three words. They know they're coming and it drives them crazy. Another really common test is that a physician will have somebody draw a clock. Um, and you know, go through and put all the numbers and then draw the hands of the clock so it's 2.30 or you know, 4.15. And somebody who has the disease, they may be able to get all of the numbers uh, or they may be able to get them all in the right spots, but the numbers are jumbled. Or they may get the numbers right, but the, the hands of the clock are coming out of the 12 as opposed to in the middle. So it, you know, their, their ability to, to judge and, and the way that their brain works, they're, they're seeing something different. Uh, so being tested can be a multi-step process. I advise you to be very, very patient, um, knowing that it's going to take multiple visits because they're going to want to test for multiple things to make sure that this is actually what you have. But if you or a loved one do receive a diagnosis, it's important that you know that there are resources out there. One of them is this 24-7 helpline. You can speak to a licensed clinical social worker at one o'clock in the morning if you cannot get your brain to turn off, if you're stressing about something, if you're worried that you have a diagnosis, if you're worried about your, your spouse or your parent, you can talk to somebody any time of the day. Likewise, if you have questions, if you see an ad on Sunday football about some vitamin that can increase your memory and you wanna ask about it, you can call them and you can talk to somebody. We also have a massive website, uh, alz.org. You can pretty much find anything that you want on our website. Highly recommend that you go and visit because there's a lot of information that's on there. And then there's also this tool um, called the Community Resource Finder where you can find local programs like this one or support groups. You can also find uh, neurologists, elder law attorneys, long-term care. It's in partnership with AARP. We are getting close to our walk time, our walk to end Alzheimer's. Just know that there are so many ways that you can be interacting with the association. You can volunteer, 
you can be one of our advocates who go and speak at the, the local and national level regarding legislation. Uh, we are a huge mover and shaker when it comes to Alzheimer's dementia and senior care legislation. We talked a little bit about trial match, the walk to end Alzheimer's is coming up this fall and the longest day is another way that we raise money. So we talked about a lot and I'm fearful that I talked very quick, but I would love to be able to pass it back to Stephanie or and just open it up for any questions that people may have. Everyone, thank you so much, Maggie, um, for presenting for us today. I know the information you sh uh, shared is truly invaluable. And so for me and everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we do have some time for a few questions. Um, okay. TBI cause onset of dementia. Can you say that one more time, Stephanie? Sure. Can TBI cause onset, onset of dementia? Can Traumatic they, brain they, injury. Trauma oh yes, absolutely. So if there is any damage to the brain, and I'd like to point out whether it's physical or mental, um, can cause dementia. We did a conference with the NFL Alumni Association last year because they're seeing such a sharp increase in NFL alumni who are getting dementia diagnoses. Likewise, there is a type of dementia specific to um, PTSD. So if somebody is experiencing post-traumatic stress where there's a dementia that is linked to post-traumatic stress. Um, so brain health is just critical. Um, if you're a bike rider, I wear your helmet. Um, if you know, you're know you participating in contact sports, try to prevent your noggin at all costs. Yeah. All right, so the next question, why is there an increased, or do you know why there is an increased risk for dementia for individuals with Down syndrome? That is such a great question. And what we know is that it's not necessarily, um, it, it's not environmental factors, it comes, it's genetic. Um, we know that there is something in those who have Down syndrome, their genetic makeup, that really causes this disease to be incredibly prevalent. Um, there's a lot of talk that if somebody who has Down syndrome lives long enough, that they will acquire this disease 100%. It's just a matter of whether they live long enough to get it. Um, so it comes down to the genetic material, which you know we we know there's an extra chromosome. Um, so it's it is an incredibly difficult disease for um, anybody within the IDD community, but including Down syndrome, because there's also other behavior changes and um, other diagnoses that are that are occurring in addition to this. Um, Stephanie has been part of a work group where we're working on uh, creating a, a caregiver support group specific for the IDD community who's concerned about memory, thinking, and behavior changes. Um, and we've been doing a series right now specific to um, IDD and Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, a huge, and Stephanie, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but you know, this is, this is something on people's minds in the IDD mm -hmm. community. It Absolutely. is something that they're concerned about. Um, and we talked about how do you know what is normal and how do you know what's abnormal? Um, so this is something where, where we are, we're working on this and there's gonna be more to come when it comes to support for that specific population. Right, so the next question is, how much does diet affect Alzheimer's rate, the Alzheimer's rate? Oh, it's a great question. Let's talk about prevention first. Diet can be huge. Um, the most recent research that came out in this past July, there were several clinical studies that were coming out specific to about heavily processed food, um, foods that have been fried or are in heavy of certain types of oils and how they impact our body. So our gut health is directly linked to our brain and um, anything that, that is going through and literally changing the way that the brain operates, that the brain works is, is not good. Um, so prevention, we know that eating colorful foods, especially leafy green vegetables, um, having as much vitamin B3 is very, very um, important in the brain. It uh, can help the brain be 
I guess the right word is more nimble. If somebody has an Alzheimer's diagnosis, there are some studies that talk about having and leading a healthy lifestyle and how there is a correlation between it potentially slowing down the progression of the disease. Where this becomes tricky, our ability to taste and our desire for food. So for example, when you see a cheeseburger on the TV uh, and it's six o'clock at night, your mouth will automatically start to water, or at least mine does, or you know, ice cream, whatever it is. Um, you know, those those things that stimulate hunger, those all happen because of our brain. This disease impacts that ability. So when somebody has this diagnosis, not only does it impact their ability to feel hunger, it also impacts their ability to taste, which means that at a certain point in the disease, it becomes very difficult to get that person to eat. So you can try and put something healthy in front of them that you think, you know, is good for their brain and may help getting them to eat it is a completely different thing. So diet's incredibly important, leafy green vegetables. I also talked about berries and fish. Um, there's lots of research on berries and fish as well. Um, but once somebody has that diagnosis, obviously trying to eat as healthy as they can for as long as they can, but recognize that you're not gonna be able to do it for the long term. Most of the Alzheimer's and dementia folks that I'm interacting with right now have a very big sweet tooth. You could put something leafy and green in front of them and they'll probably throw it over their shoulder. But if you put ice cream or a brownie in front of them, they'll be all about that. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a funny disease in that way. So diet is extremely important. Anything that's good for your heart is also going to be good for your, your brain. Thank you so much. That was such a thorough answer. I love it. <laughs> everybody's going to go out and buy strawberries now. I can already <laughs> see it. Everybody's going to go and get blueberries, strawberries. It's good. It's good for yeah. you. <laughs> All right. Next question. How do you know the difference between TBI that causes short-term memory and Alzheimer's and dementia? So there's a couple different ways. Some of it can be done with brain scans. Um, so the way that it shows up on a CAT scan specifically is very unique. Likewise, if it's an Alzheimer's diagnosis or, a, a, you know, if there's an Alzheimer's concern, they'll do a blood test because um, they can see the buildup of the beta amyloid and the tau tangles in the brain. Now, here's where it gets interesting is what they may do is they may take scans over a period of time. And this is what they often do with people when they're struggling to find out if there is a diagnosis is they'll take a scan and then six months or a year later, they'll take another one. Because if there is a continued loss of brain function, if there's more white matter, if the um, size of the brain continues to shrink, then they know that it's not necessarily from a brain injury. This is something that's happening because there is something in the brain causing that shrinkage. That's where that degenerative brain disease you know, pops up. Um, so they may not know right away. It may take multiple tests, um, but they can they can get a very very accurate diagnosis. There used to be you know kind of this misnomer that you couldn't get an Alzheimer's diagnosis until they did a brain biopsy, and that's no longer true. We can diagnose with high high degree of accuracy. With that being said, I would caution everybody getting a diagnosis through a primary care provider, although that may be some people's only option, I recognize that. Um, the best way to get a very accurate diagnosis is to work with a neurologist, geriatrician, neuropsychologist. Um, you're gonna get more accurate testing and an accurate diagnosis that way. All right, thank you. Um, I did wanna let you know we have lots of thank yous, Matt. Maggie. Uh, Good. Very, people are saying it's very informative and engaging. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks for having me. The next question is, are I think you touched on this, but um, I'll go ahead and ask, are there any known recommendations on vitamins or supplements? Oh, um, that is such a great question. So, you know, I wasn't watching a lot of TV during, during COVID uh, because I was watching Netflix, right? I, I was actually, I watched the, all of the seasons of The Office, which if you haven't watched The Office, it's a very funny show. I needed the laugh and it kind of satisfied that. So when I started watching TV again, I was watching football and I noticed that there was a supplement that was being pushed really, really hard on Sundays, talking about how it treated Alzheimer's disease, helped bring back memories and all this stuff. And I tell you what, my phone started ringing off the hook with people calling about the supplement. So what I will tell you, when it comes to vitamins and supplements, I think that there is absolutely a place for them 
depending on who you are and what it is that's going on. But I will tell you that if something is being advertised as a, a quick cure or a quick fix, nothing is that easy. Uh, I used to love to watch infomercials, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and there was one where you strapped it onto your abs and it would like stimulate your abdominals and all of a sudden you'd have a six pack. <laughs> I wish that was so true because then I could just eat all the donuts that I want. Um, so vitamins and supplements, what's so tricky is that they're not, they're not regulated by the FDA. And that means that you are completely at the mercy of whoever it is that is manufacturing that vitamin um, or that supplement. So for example, if you're looking at a supplement that says, oh, take this and all of a sudden your brain function is gonna be better. And absolutely may be true. Um, what I always tell people to look at is if they're if they're citing research, if they're citing statistics, pull up their website and it's important to know who fund who funded that research. So if that company funded their own research, keep into account that that's probably biased research. They're probably giving you statistics because they want you to buy this. But I definitely think that there is a place for vitamins and supplements and everybody's diet, me personally, especially with me having come out of, you know, chemotherapy, I'm taking calcium, I'm taking D3, I'm taking omega, I, you know, I'm taking those things because I know my body needs it. Um, but I would say that there's nothing specifically that we know that's 100% great for the brain. You know, there's done, been some research about fish oil, there's been some research done on, on different types of things, but nothing that's 100% causation that I can say, yes, go out and buy this. I know that was kind of a long answer. No, it's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to well, give a little bit of a little bit of a a, a well-rounded. I don't know. That's the best yeah. way to say it. a well-rounded. <laughs> I don't know. But here, that's why I don't know. Um, the next question is: Where is the best place to obtain a list of resources for in-home help for those that are not on the waiver but suffer from dementia? Oh man! And and right now, I will tell you the care is one of the most difficult hurdles that caregivers are trying to navigate through, whether that be in-home care, whether that be memory care facilities, you know, whatever that may be. If you're not on Medicaid waiver, um, I would reach out, I would call the helpline, call the number that's on this website. And what they'll do is they'll locate whoever your local program manager is and your local program manager will be able to answer that question for you. So I don't want to go through and point you in a different direction. I don't know your location because um, every place is a little bit different. I will tell you that if you're a caregiver and you, you know, let's say that you really want to keep your loved one at home, it's very important that you still have a couple long-term care facilities, nursing facilities, and rehab facilities in your back pocket because this journey has a lot of twists and turns and I never want you to make any decisions out of duress. I never want you to make any decisions out of stress or or quickness or you know if if some you know your loved one trips and falls they're in the hospital and they need to be released to a rehab facility I don't want you frantically making calls trying to find a facility that's not going to provide excellent care so if you're a caregiver whether you're early in the disease or 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 later always plan for the unplanned have all of these things in your tool belt so that way if you need that tool you can whip it out and you're ready to go um, I do think we have a couple uh, or a few minutes for maybe a couple more questions. Um, so the next one is, um, when should we step in when we suspect someone with dementia? How should we approach them? I love that question. I love that question. Um, and we, I just want to do a quick plug. We have another program called Know the Ten Warning Signs, which this person may find extremely beneficial um because to know the 10 warning signs it talks about 10 things to look out for and it talks about what's normal and what's abnormal if you're approaching somebody who you think has this disease it's important to keep in mind that self-awareness is a is a, a it comes from the brain so being able to notice changes in ourself that is a function of the brain not everybody notices that they're repeating themselves. Not everybody notices that they're paying bills three or four times. Um, some people who have this disease, yeah, maybe, you know, sometimes they are the ones that notice, but it's more frequently that it's a family member or a friend. If you're approaching somebody who you think 
has this disease or you're concerned about them, I would approach it with using as few you statements and more me statements. So for example, you can say, you know, I noticed that you're repeating yourself the other day. I just wanted to check in and see if, if you're okay. Have you been noticing anything like that? Uh, you know, and, and make sure that if you're, as you're talking to them, this is about them and not about you. So you, you're asking if what it is that they're experiencing, are they noticing anything? You can also check in with other family members or friends. Are they noticing something as well? Um, take into account other external factors that could be going on. Sleep deprivation, stress, uh, recently retiring. Big life changes can absolutely impact somebody's ability to think and, and do the things that they do every day. If you're having that conversation with that person, also make sure that they know that you are there for them. Don't let them go to the doctor by themselves. They need somebody to go with them. And what you say is, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about you. I would like to go get this checked out. Can we go to the doctor together and make sure that you're as healthy as you can be? You may need to have multiple conversations. You may need to write some things down. Um, so that way you, you know what it is that you're noticing or you know what it is you're gonna say. Make sure you choose a good time and day and a good place. If that person, if they are more um, responsive, more kind of energetic in the morning, do it in the morning. Don't do it at seven o'clock at night. Don't do it in a restaurant where it's busy and it's loud. Um, so make sure that you're setting yourself up for that conversation to be as successful as possible. And good luck. Thank you so much. That is that was such great advice. Um, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so that is all the time that we have for questions today. We do have um, quite a few more, okay. <laughs> I will say. That's so, okay. That's um, great. Yes. <laughs> so for anyone who had a question that we did not get to, please be on the lookout for our Q&A document, which will be on our website in two to three business days. Um, so that's basically all the time we have today. I did want to let everybody know we will not be having an informational webinar in October. However, we will be having one in November called Understanding the Medicaid Waiver Request for Approval Process. So please be on the lookout for more information in the upcoming weeks. Um, again, thank you, Maggie. You're such a wealth of knowledge. And there are so many thank yous in our chat um, that just say it was so engaging and informative. So again, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thanks, um, guys. And if anybody wants to send me those chocolate chip cookies to knock my grandma <laughs> off the pet, again, let me know. I will I'll taste all the chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day and everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.